Okay, everybody ready to study the Word of God? Yes or no? Yes. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you with all of our hearts, and we're excited about the fact that you're risen from the dead. And so, Heavenly Father, let this come alive in us. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning with verse 1, it's the story of the resurrection. I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living Translation. And here it says, early on Sunday morning. Now, Sunday morning is a big deal, everybody. It's the beginning of the week. It's, uh, it's an opportunity to start again. And so here he is, the beginning of the week, early on Sunday morning, where a new day was dawning. And this is why we Christians worship. Now, we don't, exclu we don't worship exclusively on Sunday mornings, but we often, because of tradition, we worship on Sunday mornings because it's a new week, it's a new day, the sun's coming up, so this is the opportunity to start your life all over again. About twice a week, Gail or I will say to the other, let's let tomorrow be the first day of the rest of our lives. So as we've tried to lose some weight and failed miserably, we just start again. Or if we've tried to eliminate some debts or whatever and failed miserably, we just start again tomorrow. So the opportunity to start again is very, very important. All right? And so here he says, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. And by the way, we will go to the place in October where this happened. And there's a place where, where when you look at it, and when you see it, and when you see where it is in relationship to where they had the crucifixion, and relationship to the city of Jerusalem, you see exactly how all this happened. So you'll see these places. Here he says, he said on it, his face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And so here the angels are actually saying, after arriving with bright lights and with a, an earthquake and with the guards who had been assigned by Rome to make sure nothing happened, they faint. They pass out as if they're dead. And then the angel says to the women, would you like to go into the grave and see where that body used to be laying? Now, here's why they do this. It's because our faith is not based on, on a dream or a fantasy. We don't just hope God is real. God made every, every effort here to prove with empirical evidence that he was alive. He demonstrated what God was like. He died on the cross. He was buried in a grave. He rose from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, he met with his disciples and he appeared to hundreds of other people. All right. So it's not a guess, everybody. When people say, well, I don't know if I believe in Jesus. Well, there are people that also say, I don't know if we landed on the moon and I really think the earth is flat. And I think George Bush was the one that bombed the Twin Towers. That crowd. Because there's more evidence, there's more evidence that Jesus was alive, that he did his miracles, that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. There's more evidence of that than many major public figures that lived only 150 years ago. Jesus is alive, everybody, and the evidence is clear. And here he was doing what he always does. God was doing what he always does. He was letting the evidence speak. Come, see where the body was laying. Nobody's having a vision here. Nobody's having a dream here. They're having a discussion with angels that are manifesting themselves as guards are still alive, but they're laying there as if they were dead. 
And now, and you can still go to the place. You can still see the sights. It's an incredible, incredible reality. So many religious ideas and so many faith positions are based on somebody's vision or somebody's hope or, or somebody's idea of how people ought to behave or how people ought to be with one another or those types of things. There, it's, it's an ideology or it's a, it's a series of thoughts that people will try to promote, not Christianity. Christianity is based on the life of a person that lived, that did signs and wonders and miracles, that proved he was the Son of God without a doubt. Then he died a bloody, gory, awful death. Then the soldiers drove a spear into his side to make sure his heart wouldn't function and his lungs wouldn't function and his organs were uh, pierced. Then they wrapped him up they put him in a grave, they covered it up, and then on Easter Sunday morning, there was such a power encounter that the stone rolled away, there was an earthquake, angels appeared, soldiers fainted, and then the angel said, don't be afraid. <laughs> this is a remarkable moment. So God in his drama had everybody in turmoil. And then he says, don't be afraid because that's how God is. All right. Here he says, come see where the body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. See, they're not saying keep it secret. They're not saying hide it. They're saying, tell it. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. Now, when you're in Israel, you will see that the place there right beside Jerusalem where Jesus was buried that's quite a distance from Galilee. All right, we will drive that distance and you will see the distance and we'll talk about this whole scene when we're there. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. So this angel is saying, you're going to see the dead guy there. Right there's where his body used to be. He's not there anymore. He's in Galilee. Head up to Galilee. You can see him there. The women ran quickly. You would think so ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the, disciple the, angel's message, the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. All right, there you have it. As they were going, Jesus met them and greeted them. They ran to him. They grasped his feet and they worshiped him. Okay, so here they are. Jesus is appearing to them. They know who he is. They're grasping his feet. This is a major encounter here, everybody. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. He was dead a little while ago. Okay, what's this popular show right now about dead people walking around? The Walking Dead. I should have known that. Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave, for, to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city and told the leading priests what had happened. So the priests and the elders, they had a meeting, and they decided to give the soldiers a lot of money. And they told the soldiers, you've got to say that Jesus' disciples came during the night while you were sleeping and stole the body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it to this day. So corruption, bribery, lies, oh, fake news, not new. <laughs> then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. Here they go, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. See that? When they saw him, he wasn't a no-show. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a fantasy. One sees and the others don't. It wasn't a vision. There was a man who was dead, whom they had ministered with for three years. He was dead. Now he's alive. They see him. And it starts to dawn on them who this man really is. See, everybody, why not worship him? What in the world are we thinking?
by skipping out on the Lord Jesus or allowing some idol in life to take the place of Christ in our hearts. Some sensual sin, some lie, some deception. It's not worth it, everybody. Jesus Christ is alive. Easter has come alive. Resurrection has come alive in every one of us. We don't have to be normal. Well, look at your neighbor and say, you're not normal anyway. Okay? We don't have to live like that, everybody, because Christ's life inside of us makes us so we can do amazing things. He's not dead. He knows you. He's not discouraged by you. He's not hurt by you. He loves you. He wants to work in you. You have no reason to fear because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. There is no devil that can overcome you because Christ has risen from the dead. There's no habit. There's no addiction. There's no lie. There's nothing that can conquer you. No one can be your Lord because Jesus is alive. See, because Jesus is alive, I mean, whatever you want to do in him in the future, you can do because he's alive. It's not just a hope so inside of you. It's not just a conviction or a determination inside of you. He is a person who is alive and he is making intercession for you right now. He has a plan for you that is beyond your greatest imagination. He is not against you. He is for you. He does not accumulate a list of your inadequacies against you. He's not doing that. He's bragging about you. He likes you. He's a fan of yours. He suffered more for you than anybody ever has or ever will because he loves you even more than your mama. There's nobody that loves you like Jesus loves you. There's nobody that will advocate you like Jesus will advocate for you. There is no one that will defend you like Jesus will defend you. There is no one that will protect you like Jesus will protect you. There is no one that will take care of you like Jesus will take care of you. There is no government on the earth that can minister to you the way Jesus can minister to you. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is alive. And he has called and chosen you. And so because of that, we're different. Because of that, we have hope. Because of that, today's the first day of the rest of our lives. If there's something dark and dingy inside of you that torments you, you don't have to put up with that. If there's some series of things going on around you, you don't have to submit to that. Some series of things that's negative. You don't have to submit to that. You're called. You're chosen. You're set apart for the kingdom of God. The spirit of the Lord is inside of you. There is a deposit of heaven inside of you. You are not even able to enjoy sin the way others do. Because you are hopelessly saved. You've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Healing is working inside of your life. Your mind is being renewed. Your thoughts are being transformed. As you grow in Christ, he has things planned for you that you've never thought or even been able to imagine. Why in the world would you resist him? Why in the world would anybody run from him? When he is the one that loves you more than any other in the universe. And here he meets with his people. They worshiped him. But some still doubted. But see, we have more evidence than they had. We have a bigger book than they do. We have the fullness of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit had been poured out the way we know it now. You can go into an auditorium and worship the Lord a little bit or go into your bedroom or go into a closet and worship a little bit. And he may not be in the fire. He won't be in the earthquake. He won't be in the lightning. But there will be a stillness that will come into your heart that will shout. And it'll change you. It'll heal you. It'll transform you. It'll make you a brand new creation. It'll make you a different person. It'll make it so 
Hatred doesn't work in you anymore, and judgment doesn't work into you anymore, and deception doesn't work for you anymore, but all of a sudden you have dignity on the inside because you realize the God of the universe has spoken into your heart. And you're not just a product of your parents getting together. You are a product of the living God pointing at you and saying, I want you to be in me. You have no obligation to darkness. You have no obligation to hate. You have no obligation to greed. You have no obligation to be controlled by the things of this world because you are a son and a daughter of the living God. You are somebody. You've been set apart to be part of his kingdom. You are his portion. You are his bride. You are the building of the Lord put together to serve him. And I know there'll be all types of people, all types of spirits and all types of ideas that will wage war against that. Why? It's because the greatest thing a human being can ever experience is the life of Christ inside of him. So they'll say, did God really say? They'll say, there is no God. They'll say, God is dead. They'll say, you're living in a fantasy. They will accuse you. They will try to harden your heart. They'll try to do all types of things. But you just rise above all that. Because you know that Jesus Christ is alive. So Jesus came to his disciples and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Think of that. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. That's what we do around here. Actually, that's all we do around here. We just make disciples because as you're making a disciple, the old things of the world that were designed to destroy people's lives just drops off of them. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. And so that's why we teach. And it's why we talk about, it's not just belief, it's doing. Just because Jesus fully paid the price for all of our sins does not relieve us of the responsibility to imitate Christ. We are holiness people. And you know what that means? That means we don't have to be enslaved with the stuff that the world has to offer. We can break it. It says, teach the disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm not leaving. Okay, everybody, Ephesians, the second chapter. I know this is boring, but just hang in with me. I know this is average. This is just like watching the evening news and you're just kind of drowsy hearing all the bad news of what people have done to ruin each other's lives. This is the opposite of that. This is what God himself, the creator of heaven and earth, has done to relieve you and to use you as a mighty instrument for his kingdom. He's not interested in embarrassing you. He is not interested in making you tired. He is not interested in betraying you in any way. He rose from the dead after paying the price for all of your sins and all of your failures and all of your doubts and all of your fears. After paying that price, he rose from the dead, vibrant and alive. And he communicated clearly that what he did on the cross worked. So here in Ephesians, the second chapter, follow along with me here. The Bible says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world. Sin means violation of God's perfect plan for your life. All right, so here's how this works. God doesn't want you to be hateful and, and addicted or greedy and bitter or whatever. So he has a plan for you where you can live in his Sabbath day rest. He has a plan for you so that you can have peace in your heart. He has a plan for you set up so beautifully. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. He is not going to dump a bunch of stuff on you. 
He's going to help. He's going to be there in the midst of your pain and your suffering and your crying that is inherent in being on earth. He's there with you. But here he says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, used to live in sin. And uh, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, all of us. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our own sinful natures. And every one of us have that, whether it's pride, whether it's arrogance, whether it's laziness. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Now notice this, everybody. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved you so much, that even though every one of us were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Okay, now everybody follow this. Since Jesus rose from the dead, you, therefore, can rise from the dead. Amen. See, we're not just celebrating Jesus' resurrection this morning. We're celebrating your resurrection and mine. Okay, we're celebrating the fact that there's a new name written down in heaven and it's mine. We're celebrating the fact that once we used to be enslaved by sin and death and all the stuff that comes with that, we're not. We've come out of a grave of bondage of all this stuff out there in the world. And we don't have to live in that any longer, everybody. Why don't we have to live in it any longer? It's because Jesus came out of a grave of death. And therefore, we can come out of that same grave of death. And by the way, it happens both ways. It happens spiritually while we're here in our bodies. But then we're going to die. Our bodies will decompose, will become dust. And then there's a day when you'll receive your resurrection body, just like Jesus received his. What Jesus did, you will do as a believer in him. So if you looked at yourself in the mirror and it discouraged you this morning, have hope. Jesus is alive. <laughs> that 10 pounds you've lost 30 times, you're going to be perfect in heaven. You won't need makeup. You won't have to go ride your bike for any reason other than just to enjoy the air and the scenery. Did all of you see my bike in the back of my truck this morning? You need to pay important attention to the important things. It's been there all year. And I, and I haven't ridden it once. You need to stop paying attention to those things. All right, look at this, everybody. This is very interesting. Here it says, for, verse 4, But God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. In other words, by his favor. Because he, Hey, here's what it means. It's, it's only because God liked you so much that he saved you. It's only because God liked you so much that you're in church this morning. Because for you to come to church on a Sunday morning is a miracle. It can only happen if God's working in your heart. So stop saying God's not working in your heart. Stop saying he doesn't hear your prayers. Stop saying he's neglecting you. He is not. If you'll draw near to him, he will draw near to you every time. Right. Here it says, for he raised us from the dead. You see it? When Jesus rose from the dead, so did you. It's Easter Sunday morning, everybody. You came out of the grave this morning. Here it says, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. In other words, positionally, you're already seated at the right hand of God the Father in Christ Jesus. 
That's why when you pray, you pray in Jesus' name because you're praying in his stead because you're in him. So when you say, I pray this in Jesus' name, that's just not a routine thing. That's you recognizing the fact that you're praying from the authority that you have at the right hand of God the Father in Christ Jesus, far above all principalities and powers. There is no devil that can rule over you or your family. And if there is a devil ruling over you and your family, it's only because we're allowing it. It's because we've become passive and whiny and waiting around for somebody else to do it for us. This Jesus thing is awesome. And it's true, and it's right, and it's so... I mean, I just can't get over it. I can't recover from this Jesus thing. He's touched me, and I can't act as if it didn't happen. There's just no way. It's possessed me. I'm possessed by the Spirit, is, by the Spirit who's called Holy. And he won't let me go. He is a hound of heaven. He chases me into the darkest pits. And he chases me into the highest heavens. When I'm in this building over here by myself, he is here. When I'm here with all of you people worshiping, he is here. When I'm out all by myself taking a hike, he is there. When I'm with my wife and family and kids and some of you friends, he is there. This Jesus is as high as you can get and as low as you can get. You can't go so low that he won't touch you. You can't get so depressed or so sick that he won't touch you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always there. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Here's what that verse means. That verse means God's doing miracles inside of you so he can show you off. Moms and dads love showing off their good kids. If the kids are bad, it brings some shame to them. But if their kids are good, they brag about them. They show them off. And even if they're bad, they'll lie a little bit to make them sound better. Okay? It's because our children are our glory. We draw a lot from our, from our children, from those we've influenced and those that have turned out well. All right, that's the way God is with you. Some of you this morning are struggling with some sin. God's going to take care of that so he can show you off. He will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. So all the people have said, you're going to be poor all your life. He's going to give you something so... So their curses don't have to be real. Amen. When other people have said, you'll never succeed. You'll never have healthy relationships. You'll never make it. You'll never be okay. They are wrong. They are wrong. They are wrong. How do I know they're wrong? It's because Jesus wants to show you off. And you may say, yeah, I'm an addict and I can't get over it. Listen, God's going to set you free so he can show you off. So you can stand there and you can say, I used to be addicted to this or I used to be addicted to that, but Jesus touched me. I'm not addicted anymore. And God's saying, see, devil, I told you. See, he wants to show you off. And so come on, put your shoulders back. Stand up straight. Be the man or the woman of God that God has created you to be because you are evidence of the resurrection. You are the living proof that Jesus is alive. And here when the Bible talks about it, he just says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples. Now, I know you're going to live a few years and then you're going to step out of your body and then you'll be present with the Lord. But even in future ages, God's going to be showing people, did you see what I did in this fella? Did you see what I did in that woman? Do you see what I did in that little boy? He's going to use your testimony against the devil for generations. It's a wonderful thing. I love the way God shows off. God saved you by, verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this, everybody. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. We're God's masterpiece living inside of God's masterpiece. 
have you noticed the sunshine and the snow and the fresh air and the beautiful place we all live? You are his masterpiece, living in a masterpiece. Yeah, we need to gripe and complain about this. This just isn't good enough. I just don't buy it. It's just not good. I just can't stop smiling. People think I'm stoned. <laughs> but it's this thing. I, we're God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us from the time we were conceived or before the ages. Not only does Jesus change our lives, but he changes the world around us. You know, all through the ages, people have said to others, you'll never be smart enough, you'll never be good enough, you'll never be able to do it. And then Jesus touches people's lives and they do incredible things. You know, it used to be that sex was violent and mean and, and it was just a horrific, horrific thing that was in human culture. We were just animals. And then Christ came and filled some people with the Spirit and they started to say, um, husbands, love your wives the way Christ loves the church. Wives, relate to your husbands as the church relates to Christ. So that the two can become one the same way we in the church become one with Christ and Christ becomes one with us. And when we become one with one another, we produce offspring. That changed sex. It made husbands respect and honor their wives. It caused wives to respect and honor their husbands. And all of a sudden, intimacy became beautiful instead of barbaric. That changed the world. We're still fighting for it today. But it's a beautiful, beautiful thing when a man loves a woman and a woman loves a man. And when they do it as an expression of service toward one another, it's incredible. And when it's expressed in marriage, where they're committed to one another, the way Christ is committed to us in the church and the way we in the church are committed to Christ, that's a wonderful expression of delight. So not only does Easter morning change us, Easter morning changes our families. Easter morning changes our culture. Used to be, and in many places of the world today, women are just property. Treated like trash. Not respected. Then Paul wrote, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, about how we become servants of one another. And Christ became servants of all, so God made him the head of the church. So all of a sudden we got the idea, oh, power isn't for domination and abuse. Power is to make the lives of other people better. Because of that, our police cars say to protect and serve. Because of that, our strongest military in the world is always submitted to somebody who's been elected by and for the people. Because the Bible in Philippians, the second chapter, gave us the idea that power and wealth and authority was there to serve, not to dictate and rule and manipulate and abuse. So we can look around the places in the world where people have political or financial power and they use it to abuse others, to destroy others and kill them. But where the cross has greatest influence, we have public servants instead of dictators. We have people that want to make life better for citizens instead of just using citizens as cattle. See, so this resurrection power, it's not just something in our hearts. It's something that once it gets into us, it changes the world. You know, we have 
universal education in the West because the church started to say, everybody needs to know. It's always better to know than to not know. Ignorance is a, is a horrible, horrible thing that affects people. And if people can know, it's better. So some of the greatest universities in the world were birthed by Christians, for Christians. And the earliest, earliest places where we had education for all, it was done by monks and monasteries and places like that where they thought, we need to make sure the peasants know because the peasants were no longer scum. The peasants now had equal dignity before God as the king. The peasants now had equal dignity before God as the wealthiest person in the region. But that wasn't the case before the cross influenced them. That wasn't the case before resurrection came. So because of it, our nation strives for equality under the law. We haven't perfected it. We are human, and this is a human system. But we, we, we have an ideal of equality under the law because of Easter Sunday morning. We have soldiers that are well-equipped and powerful trying to serve people instead of abuse people because of Easter Sunday morning. Everybody, the list goes on and on. Used to be family had a, if a family had a kid like Jonathan, you know our boy Jonathan, special needs child. Used to be if a family had somebody like him, he'd be dead within the first year or two. They'd put him out in the woods, let him die. Or they'd, they, you, you can go to many places in the world right now where the special needs people, they're alongside the road, all dirty. Nobody takes care of them. Mom and dad are long gone, and they just throw them a piece of bread once in a while or whatever, and they sleep naked under a tree. But not in places where people figured out Easter. We figured out Easter more than some others. And so because of it, a man like Jonathan, we treat him with respect. I tried to. But see, that's a, that's a whole, uh, when, when, when all of a sudden the world's turned upside down where we can say a pauper and a king have equal access to the Holy of Holies. The children of a pauper and a king are equal in the sight of God. Therefore, the king gets one vote and so does the pauper. That whole idea is us working what does this mean? What is Easter? How does it apply? And so because of that, we started building hospitals. Because they used to say, oh, sick people, they've got a devil. Throw them out. They didn't even care for them. Then, because of the gospel, we not only started caring for the sick, we started ex spending huge amounts of money and effort to take care of the sick because we wanted to take care of the poor and the sick, the orphans, and the widows used to be, if a woman became a widow, if she didn't have sons, she'd just be thrown out and die. That didn't happen. It, I should say, it doesn't happen in cultures that are influenced by Easter, that are influenced by the cross, that are influenced by the resurrection. It's part of humanity. Pain and suffering is part of humanity. But we in the church, because of Easter Sunday morning, we try to alleviate pain and suffering. We try to build institutions where there's an orphanage. Right? You, you hear the horrible stories about nuns taking care of orphans and how they were abused. Listen, that's such a small fraction. It was the Catholic Church and Christians all over the world building orphanages that have saved a multitude of lives. Because it used to be an orphan was just abandoned. Let him die. Used to be a widow was abandoned. Used to be a sick person was abandoned. Used to be a handicapped person. If they were weak, Darwin was right. They need to be eliminated. But we Christians said, no, we're not going to live that way. We're going to take part of our wealth and part of our power and part of our authority 
part of our influence, and we're going to make life better for other people. And when we decide that, we end up with abolishing slavery instead of embracing it. We end up with free and fair elections instead of deception all the time, every place. We end up with at least an attempt to make life better for the other guy, even if he's not like us. That's Easter Sunday morning. So we need to embrace Easter, not just for our own liberation and freedom, but for the liberation and freedom of others in our community and others around the world, because frankly, everybody, this is all we have to do. So if something wicked is gripping your life, get rid of it so that you can wash the feet of the other guy. If selfishness is creeping into your life, get rid of it. If drugs or abuse or hate is gripping into your, is, is seeping into your life, get rid of that because there are feet to be washed. There are sick that need to be healed. There are the dead out there that need to be raised. There are lepers that need to be cleansed. There are the sick and the crying and the dying that you can breathe the breath of life into if you'll let life be in you. It's Easter Sunday morning, everybody. Jesus Christ came out of the grave. You and I have come out of our grave. Now let's help others come out of their grave. Amen?